Howdy. This video is on the nomenclature of isotopes and subatomic particles. To understand nuclear reactions and radioactivity, you need to understand the symbols used to represent isotopes and radioactive particles. And so after watching this video, given the symbol of an isotope or subatomic particle, you should be able to determine what it is composed of. You should be able to identify the symbols for isotopes or subatomic particles. You should be able to identify the differences and similarities of different types of radiation, which one is the most penetrating, the most dangerous, the fastest, etc. And so if we think about an atom, the diameter of a hydrogen atom is on order of one angstrom, or 10 to the minus 10th meters. Now this visualization is really pretty bad. It seems to imply the electrons are particles. Electrons are not particles. They are not little spheres that rotate around the nucleus. It's better to think about in terms of electron density. So I'm sorry this visualization is bad. Please remember electrons are not particles. But the diameter is something on the order of 10 to the minus 10th meters. Now the nucleus inside the atom is much, much smaller. It's on the order of 10 to the minus 14th meters. And so most of, most of an atom is composed of electron density. Now the nucleus is composed of nucleons, protons, and neutrons. And so we can classify protons and neutrons as nucleons, those particles that are in the nucleus. <clears throat> now if we look at protons and neutrons, they are composed of quarks, three quarks. And so protons composed of two up quarks and one down quark, a neutrons composed of two down quarks and one up quark. Now, just like an electron is not a hard sphere, not a particle in that sense, protons and neutrons are also not a particle in that sense. They're composed of quarks. And again, quarks are not hard spheres or particles in that sense. As you get small, little stuff behaves very strangely. And so most of chemistry is about the electromagnetic force. The electrostatic interaction is an example of electromagnetic force. And so electrons are attracted to the nucleus because electrostatic interaction, opposite charged particles attract. Chemical bonds are formed because electrostatic interaction. Ionic solids are formed, electrostatic interaction. And so again, most of chemistry is about the electrostatic interaction, which is part of the electromagnetic force. Now the nucleus, it's all about the strong force. And so if you think about the nucleus, it's composed of protons and neutron, nu neutrons. And protons have a positive charge, neutrons are neutral. And so if it was just about the electrostatic interaction, the nucleus would just fly apart because like charged particles repel, opposite charged particles attract. And so Protons and nucleus are repelled by each other due to electromagnetic force, but they're attracted to each other by the strong force. Now the strong force is much stronger than the electrostatic interaction. And that's why nuclear reactions can involve dramatically more energy than chemical reactions. And so protons, neutrons, and electrons compose atoms. Protons and neutrons are in the nucleus. Electrons are outside the nucleus. Now, a couple things to notice is that basically the protons, electrons have the same charge, but they're opposite. And so protons are positively charged, electrons are negatively charged, neutrons ha are charged neutral, have no charge. And if you look at the masses, the mass of the proton and neutron is about the same, and it's about a thousand times more massive than electrons. And so protons and neutrons are about a thousand times more massive than electrons. And so we'll talk about a mass number, which is the sum of the protons and neutrons, kind of neglecting the electrons because electrons are a thousand times less massive than a proton or a neutron. And so I mentioned that protons are composed of two up quarks and one down quark. And up quark has a charge of plus two thirds. A down quark is minus one third. And so if we take two up quarks and one down quark, we end up with a plus one charge. And so protons have a plus one charge because they're composed of two up quarks and one down quark. Neutrons are composed of two down quarks and one up quark. And so two down quarks give you a minus two thirds. Again, you have a plus two thirds. And so neutrons are charge neutral because they're composed of two down quarks and one up quark. 
Now it's kind of interesting. If a proton's up quark changes into a neutron's down quark, changes into a down quark, then a proton is actually changing into a neutron. And so for mo most radioactive decays, we can think about it on three different levels. We can think about it in terms of an up quark changing into a down quark, or we can think about it in terms of a proton changing into a neutron, or we can think about going from one element to another element. Likewise, if a neutron's down quark changes into a, an up quark, then a neutron's changing into a proton, and again, you're going from one element to another element. And so again, three different layers we can think about in terms of quarks, we can think about in terms of protons and neutrons, and we can think about it in terms of going from one element to another element. And so an isotope is the same number of protons, different number of neutrons. And so protons define the element. All carbon atoms have six protons. If you have neutral carbon atoms, you also have six electrons so that it's charged neutral. But different isotopes will have a different number of neutrons. Now, neutrons have no charge. The only thing that changes by having a different number of neutrons is the mass. And so as long as you have six protons, basically the chemistry is going to be the same if you have carbon 11, carbon 12, carbon 13, or carbon 14. The, the mass number doesn't really matter in terms of reactivity, but it's kind of cool. We can actually use the different isotopes to monitor chemical reactions to try to determine the mechanism for how um, a molecule may react. And so isotopes have this, of the same element have the identical chemical behavior. Their mass is just a little bit different. And again, isotopes are often used in studies of kinetics to try to identify what is the actual mechanism for the reaction. But given the number of protons and neutrons, you should be able to determine what isotope it is, or if you're given the isotope, you should be able to determine how many protons and neutrons you have. Now, if we think about the product table, and I think about it a lot, you know, we have the atomic symbol here above it, we have the atomic number, and the atomic number is just the number of protons. And so I'm not sure I can stress it enough that it's the number of protons that defines the chemical reactivity for an element. So all carbon have six protons, but the atomic number is the number of protons. It's also the charge of the nucleus. So all carbon atoms have a plus six charge of the nucleus because they have six protons. Now the number below the element is the atomic mass. Now it's a weighted average of all isotopes. And so because carbon has six protons and most isotopes six neutrons, that gives you a atomic mass of 12 for most carbon for most carbon. But you also have carbon 13 and carbon 14. And so the mass is going to be a little bit different. But again, please remember this is a weighted average over the nat natural abundance of the different isotopes. And so this number is going to be closest to the most common um, naturally occurring isotope. Now the elements in red here um, are all man-made. And so instead of having a mass, they'll have this square bracket and it lists the isotope that is the most stable. But none of the ones in red are naturally occurring. They're all man-made. So everything after uranium is man-made. Well, now everything in red has no stable isotopes. And so all elements after bismuth have no stable isotopes. They're all radioactive. Promethium, technetium also have no stable isotopes. There are some um, elements, some promethium, technetium, still in natural samples, I guess that means their um, half-life was long enough that they, they have remained. But in this plot, all the ones in red, no stable isotopes. And so 
we have the nomenclature for an isotope. The top number is the mass number. It's the number of protons plus neutrons. And again, we're neglecting the electrons because while they do have a mass, the mass of electron is a thousand times less than a proton or neutron about. Now the bottom number is the atomic number. It's the number of protons. It's also the charge. And so when we're talking about um, particles like an alpha particle, the bottom number will be the charge of the particle. When we're talking about isotopes, it's still the, the charge of the nucleus also corresponds to the number of protons in the nucleus. And so we can symbolize an isotope this way. We can also write the name of the, isotope, of the element and then include the mass number. And so this would be carbon 12, means we have six protons, six neutrons. Above that, we also have carbon 12. And so given the symbol, you should be able to determine that, again, the mass is the top. And this gives you the charge, which is the bottom number. And again, the bottom number is the number of protons. When you're talking about isotopes, it's also the charge of the nucleus. And then the top number is the mass number. Now, this will be important when we start balancing um, nuclear reactions, because we'll see that we have to make sure that the top numbers are the same products of reactants, the sum, and the sum of the bottom numbers are the same products of reactants. Now, when we're talking about radioactive particles like an alpha or beta particle, again, the bottom number is the charge. When we're talking about the isotope, it's also the charge of the nucleus. And so a stable isotope is one that does not spontaneously decompose it into another. A radioactive isotope or nucleide, and I'll use isotope and nucleide interchangeably, is one that does spontaneously decompose into another because it's not stable. And so radioacti radioactivity, the three co most common types of emissions would be alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma rays. Now, alpha particles are high energy helium nuclei. Now, when I was a student a long, long time ago, that always confused me. Why helium nuclei? And the reason is that when you have two protons and two neutrons, that just gives you a fairly stable thing. And so it composes helium nuclei, helium-4 nuclei. It also composes alpha particles. Okay, so two protons plus two neutrons, fairly stable. Alpha particles and helium-4 nuclei. Beta particles are high energy electrons that originate from the nucleus. And so until you have beta decay, the beta particle did not exist. Now gamma rays are very short energy, high, short wavelength, high energy electromagnetic radiation. The British scientist Ernest Rutherford was one of the first to show that radioactivity could consist of three distinct types of radiation. The three types differ in their response to an electric field. A source of radioactivity is passed through a hole to form a beam. The beam is directed at a fluorescent screen, which is illuminated when it is struck. In the absence of an electric field, all the radioactivity beam strikes the target at a single point. When an electric field is applied, the initial beam is separated into three components. One of these is deflected upward by the electric field, indicating that it is negatively charged. These radioactive emissions are called beta rays. A part of the beam is deflected downward, indicating that these particles are positively charged. These radioactive emissions are called alpha rays. Notice that the alpha particles are deflected less than the beta particles by the same electric field. This occurs because the alpha particles are more massive, but the amount of deflection is also determined by the relative energies of the different types of radiation. The portion of the original beam that is undeflected is due to radiation that is not charged. These emissions are referred to as gamma rays. Other experiments showed later that the beta rays are actually high-speed electrons. The alpha particles proved to be helium nuclei. The gamma rays are high-energy photons, analogous to X-ray. 
And so again, please remember alpha particles just happen to be two protons and two neutrons, which are also corresponds to a helium-4 nucleus. And so the gamma rays <coughs> weren't affected by the, the electric field because gamma rays have no charge. And so it's kind of interesting. Alpha particles, they're pretty massive, two protons plus two neutrons, so a mass number of four. They also have a plus two charge, and so they don't penetrate very far into things. But if they do get in your body, they can cause a lot of a lot of damage. So radon is an alpha emitter, and so it's it's a noble gas that is a product of uranium and radium decomposing, and it can get in people's houses. And if you breathe it in, it can then emit an alpha particle, which can actually cause um, cancer. Beta particles, because they're high energy electrons, um, they have a negative charge. They're better penetrating than the alpha particle. They're lighter and a smaller charge. Gamma rays, X-rays, can actually penetrate more. They have, while they do have a mass, but they have no charge. And the neutrons, which have no charge, can penetrate even farther. And so different forms of radiation have different abilities to penetrate. And again, outside your body, alpha is probably the, the, mo the least harmful, but inside your body, alpha is probably the most harmful. And so again, you should remember that, you know, electrons are, and positrons are a thousand times less massive than protons, and hence are not included in the mass number. The mass number is just composed of the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. And so the symbols that we use for the radioactive particles are exactly the same as the symbols that we use for isotopes. The top number is the mass number, number of protons plus neutrons. Bottom number is the charge. Again, for isotopes, that's the charge of the nucleus. And I should mention that positron is just basic, it's the antiparticle for electron. It's just a positive charge version of electron. And again, the mass numbers for electron positron are zero. They still have a mass. It's just the mass of electron is about a thousand times less than that of a proton or a neutron. And so the symbols are exactly the same, mass number on top, number of protons plus neutrons, and then charge in the bottom. And for an isotope, it's the charge of the nucleus. And so again, you should be able to go from the symbol to the number of protons plus neutrons to the mass and the charge. You should be able to go from the number of protons plus neutrons or the mass and the charge to the symbol. I hope that was helpful.